Chapter 5. Because my eyes burn with tears, I'm afraid I excused myself from luncheon rather hastily. I needed to be outside. Fresh air would cool my heated feelings. Pausing only to snatch up the new drawing kit Mum had given me, I ran out to the kitchen door and through the vegetable garden, past the empty stables across the overgrown lawn, and into the wooded portion of the estate. Then, out of breath, I walked on beneath the oaks, feeling somewhat better. It seemed I was alone in the forest. The constables and other searchers had passed on to the more distant fields and moorlands. The woodland sloped downward, and at the bottom of that inclined, I reached my favourite place, the deep rocky dell where ferns draped like a lady's green velvet evening gown over the stones, trailing down to a pebbly stream that formed a pool under a leaning willow. Heedless of my frock and pantalets, I clambered over rocks and ferns until I reached the willow. Hugging its stout trunk, I laid my cheek against its mossy bark. Then I ducked beneath it to crawl into a shady hollow between the overhanging tree and the stream. The cool nook was my secret hideaway, known to no one except me. Here I kept things I liked, things Mrs. Lane would have thrown out if I had brought them into the house. As my eyes grew accustomed to the shadows, I settled into my earthy den, looking around at little shelves I had built out of stones. Yes, there were my snail shells, my many-coloured pebbles, my acorn caps, some bright jay feathers, a cufflink and a broken locket, and some other treasures I had found in magpies' nests. With a sigh of relief, I curled my knees up to my chin, in a most unladylike fashion, unwrapped my arms around my shins, and gazed at the eddying water just beyond my feet. Trout fingerlings swam in the pool, watching them dart and school, dart and school. Usually I could mesmerize myself in a sort of daze, but not today. All I could think of was, was could have become of Mum, how I would have to go home eventually, and she would not be waiting for me but my brothers would, and when I entered, with a great deal of dirt all over my frock, they would say, A pox on my brothers! Putting my knees down where they belonged, I opened my new drawing kit to take pencil in hand and a few sheets of paper. On one of these I drew a hasty, but not particularly nice, picture of Mycroft, in his spats and his monocle, and his heavy po pocket watch chain looped across his protruding waistcoat. Then I drew a similarly quick picture of Sherlock, or lanky legs, and nose and chin. Then I wanted to draw Mum, but I was angry at her too. I wanted to sketch her as she might have looked the day she went away, in a hat like an upside-down flowerpot, turkey-back jacket, and a bustle so ridiculous. And she hadn't taken her art kit with her. And she hadn't expected to be back for my birthday celebration. And she had been up to something, much as it hurt, I admitted it now. Confound her! The whole time I'd been searching for her in a panic, she'd been doing very well on her own, enjoying some adventure without me. One would think I might feel glad to conclude that she was alive. Quite to the contrary, I felt wretched. She had abandoned me. Why hadn't she just cast me off in the first place, put me in a blanket and left me on a doorstep where I was born? Why had she left me now? Where might she have gone? Instead of sketching, I sat thinking. Laying aside my drawings, I wrote a list of questions. Why did Mum not take me with her? If she had any distance to travel, why did she not use the bicycle? Why did she dress so oddly? Why did she not leave by the gate? If she struck out across country on foot, where was she going? Supposedly, she found transportation. Again, where was she going? What did she do with all the money? If she were running away, why did she carry no baggage? Why would she run away on my birthday? Why did she leave me no word of explanation or farewell? Putting down my pencil, I stared at the eddying stream, the fingerlings flowing past like dark tears. Something rustled in the underbush that flanked the willow. As I turned to look, a familiar fairy head poked into my hollow. Oh, Reginald, I complained, let me alone. But I leaned towards the old collie. He thrust his broad, blunt snout at my face, fanning his tail as I put my arms around his shaggy neck. "'Thank you, Reginald,' said a cultured voice. My brother Sherlock stood over me. Gasping, I pushed Reginald away and reached for the papers I had left lying on the ground, but not quickly enough. Sherlock picked them up first. He gawked at my drawings of Mycroft himself, 
then threw his head back and laughed, almost silently, yet quite heartily, rocking back and forth until he had to sit down on a shelf of rock beside the willow tree, gasping for breath. I felt on fire with mortification, but he was smiling. Well done, Anola, he chuckled when he could speak. You have quite the knack for caricature. He gave the sketches back to me. It would perhaps be best if Mycroft were not to see those. Keeping my red face down, I slipped the papers into the bottom of the drawing kit. My brother said, Sometime that tree is going to tumble right into the water, you know, and it is to be hoped you will not be underneath it when that happens. He was not mocking my hideaway, at least, but I felt a mild reproach in his words and his desire for me to come out. Frowning, I did so. He asked, What is that paper you have in your hand? May I see? My list. I gave it to him, telling myself I didn't care any more what he thought of me. I sat slumping on another fern-upholstered rock as he read. He paid close attention to my list. Indeed, he pondered it, his narrow hawk nose face quite serious now. You have certainly covered the salient points, he said finally, with some small air of surprise. I think we can surmise that she did not leave by the gate, because she did not want the lodgekeeper to see in which direction she was going, and for the same reason she did not want to use the roads where she might meet with some witness. She has been clever enough to leave us with no idea whether she went north, south, east, or west. I nodded, sitting up straighter, feeling uncountably better. My brother Sherlock had not laughed at my thoughts. He was talking with me. That nameless butterfly fluttering in my heart, I began to sense now what it was. It had started when I found out that my brother's quarrel was with my mother, not with me. It was a hope, a dream, a yearning, really, now that there might be a chance. I wanted my brothers to... I did not dare to think in terms of affection, but I wanted them to care for me, a little, somehow. Sherlock was saying... As for your other points, Sonola, I hope to clear them up very soon. I nodded again. One question I do not understand. While I asked Lane for a description of your mother's attire, I failed to see how it was odd. I blushed, remembering my shocking blunder with Lane, and only just managed to murmur, Um, the, uh, tenure. Ah, the bustle. It was perfectly all right for him to say it. As the cannibal asked, the missionary's wife, are all your women so disformed? Well, there is no accounting for the ways ladies choose to adorn themselves. The whims of the fair sex defy logic. He shrugged, dismissing the subject. Enola, I am returning to London within the hour. Therefore, I searched you out in order to say goodbye to you, and tell you it has been delightful to see you again after all these years. He offered his hand, gloved, of course. I grasped it for a moment. I could not speak. Mycroft will remain here for a few days, Sherlock went on, little as he cares to be away from his dear Diogenes club. After swallowing to regain my voice, I asked, What will you do in London? File an inquiry with Scotland Yard, search the passenger lists of steamships companies for women travelling alone, in case, as we hypothesise, Our stray mother has left England for the south of France, or some such artistic mecca. Or perhaps she is making a pilgrimage to some shrine of the suffragists. He looked at me quite levelly. Enola, you have known her more recently than I. Where do you think she might have gone? The great Sherlock Holmes, asking for my thoughts. But I had none to offer. I was, after all, a girl of minimal cranial capacity. Feeling the heat of a blush once more starting to burn its way up my neck, I shook my head. Well, the constabulary reports, not a sign of her whereabouts. So, I'm off. He stood up, touching the brim of his hat as a courtesy, not quite tipping it to me. Take heart, he told me. There is no indication that she has come to any harm. Then swinging his stick, he walked up the rocks of the dell with easy dignity, as if ascending a marble staircase to some London palace. Reaching the top without turning, he raised his cane, waggling it in a kind of dismissal or farewell, then strode off towards the hall with the dog trotting adoringly after him. 
I watched him until he disappeared between the forest trees, watched after a moment as if I knew that, through no fault of his own, I would not converse with him again for a long time. Back at the hall, I went looking for the item Lane had called a dress improver, finding it where I had left it, most inappropriately, in the front parlour. I wondered why Mum had put the featherweight cushion under her dresser, yet had not worn it inside her bustle. Pondering, I took it and walked upstairs to replace it in a bedroom, in case she wanted it when she returned. But there's no reason to think she would ever return. She had, after all, chosen to leave, of her own free will. Sinking into the hard wooden arms of a hallway chair, I slumped like a comma over the prickly poof of horse hair I held. I stayed that way for a long time. Finally, I lifted my head, vengeful thoughts hardening my jaw. If Mum had left me behind, I was very well going to help myself to the contents of her rooms. This was a decision prompted partly by spleen, partly by my necessity. Having ruined my frock, I needed to change it. The few others I owned, formerly white, now yellow-green with dirt, and grass stains only looked worse. I would choose something out of Mum's wardrobe. Rising, I strode across the upstairs hallway to my mother's door and turned the knob. To no good effect, the door was locked. It had been a most annoying day. Stalking to the stairs, leaning over the banister, I allowed my voice to rise in a naughty pitch. Lane! Shh! Amazingly, for he could have been anywhere... From the chimney to the cellar, the butler appeared below me within a moment. One white-gloved finger to his lips, he informed me. Miss Anola, uh, Mr. Mycroft is napping. Rolling my eyes, I beckoned Lane to come upstairs. When he had done so, I told him more quietly. I need the key to Mother's room. Mr. Mycroft has given orders that these rooms are to be kept locked. Astonishment trumped my annoyance. Whatever for? It's not my place to ask, Miss Nola. Very well. I don't need the key if you just unlock the door for me. I should have to ask Mr. Mycroft's permission, Miss Nola. And if I awaken him, he'll be put out. Mr. Mycroft has given orders. Mr. Mycroft this, Mr. Mycroft that. Mr. Mycroft could go soak his head in a rain barrel. Tight-lipped, I thrust the dressed improver at Lane. I need to put this back where it belongs. The butler actually blushed which gratified me, as I had not seen him do so ever before. Moreover, I continued quite softly between my clenched teeth, I need to search my mother's wardrobe for something to wear. If I go down to dinner in this frock, Mr. Mycroft will be more than put out. He will froth at the mouth. Unlock the door. Without another word, Lane did so, but he, kept, but he himself kept the key and stood outside the door, waiting for me. Therefore, filled with the spirit of perversity, I took my time. But as I scanned my mother's dresses, I thought also about this new development. Locked door to Mum's rooms. Entry with my cross permission only. This would never do. I wondered whether Mum might possibly have left her own key behind. The thought frightened me, for if, dressing to go out for the day, if she had intended to return, she would have taken the key with her. Therefore, if she had left it behind, the meaning was all too plain. It took me a moment and several deep breaths to make myself reach for a walking suit, which still hung over the standing mirror. I found the key at once, in a jacket pocket. It felt heavy in my hand. I stood looking at it as if I had never seen it before. Oval handle on one end of the shank, toothed rectangle on the other. Strange cold iron thing. She really wasn't planning to come back then. Yet this hateful skeleton of metal had suddenly become my most precious possession. Clutching it, I draped a dress from my mother's wardrobe over my hand to conceal it, and went out again. Very well, Lane, I told him blandly, and he once more locked the door. At dinner, Mycroft had the courtesy to say not a word about my borrowed dress, a loose, flowing aesthetic gown which barely, which bared my neck, but hung upon the rest of me like a sheet upon a broomstick. Although I was as tall as Mum, I lacked her womanly figure. In any event, I had chosen the dress for its colour, peach touched with cream, which I loved, not for any pretense of fit. It dragged upon the floor, but very well, thus it concealed my little girl boots. 
I had tied a sash around my straight as a poker middle to resemble a waist. I wore a necklace. I had even tried to arrange my hair, although its indefinite brownish hue made it hardly a crowning beauty. Altogether, I am sure I look like a child playing dress-up, and I knew it. Mycroft, although he said nothing, clearly was not pleased. As soon as the fish was served, he told me, I have sent to London for a seamstress to provide you with proper clothing. I nodded. Some new clothes would be nice, and if I didn't like them, I could revert to my comfortable knickerbockers the moment his back was turned. But I said, There is a seamstress right here in Kindford. Yes, I am aware of that, but the London seamstress will know exactly what you need for boarding school. Whatever was he talking about? Quite patiently, I said, I'm not going to boarding school. Just as patiently, he responded, Of course you are, Anola. I have sent inquiries to several excellent establishments for young ladies. Mother had told me about such establishments. Her rational jest journals were filled with warnings about their cultivation of the hourglass figure. At one such school, the headmistress tightened a corset upon each girl who entered, and on the girl's waist the corset stayed day and night, waking or sleeping, except for one hour, a week when it was removed for ablutions. That is, so the girl could bathe. Then it was replaced tighter, depriving the wearer of the ability to breathe normally, so that the slightest shock would cause her to fall down in a faint. This was considered charming. It was also considered moral, the corset being an ever-present monitor biding its wearer to exercise self-restraint, in other words, making it impossible for the hapless victim to bend or relax her posture. The modern corsets, unlike my mother's old whalebone ones, were so long that they needed to be made of steel so as not to break, the rigidity displacing the internal organs and deforming the ribcage. One schoolgirl's corset ribs had actually punctured her lungs, causing her untimely demise. Her waist, as she lay in her coffin, had measured fifteen inches. All of this passed through my mind in an instant as my fork dropped to my plate with a clatter. I sat stunned, chilled by the horror of my situation, yet unable to state any of my objections to my brother. To speak of such intimate matters of the female form to a male was unthinkable. I was only able to gasp. But, mother, there is no assurance that your mother will ever come back any time soon. I cannot stay here indefinitely. Thank goodness, I thought. And you can't just vegetate here by yourself now, can you, Enola? Are Lane and Mrs. Lane not to stay on? He frowned, putting down the knife with which he had buttered his bread. Of course, but servants can't possibly provide you with proper instruction and supervision. I was about to say, mother would not like... Your mother has failed in her responsibility to you. His tone had grown considerably sharper than the butter knife. What is it to become of you if you do not require such accomplishments, some social graces, some finish? You will never be able to move in polite society, and your prospects of matron matrimony. A dire to nil, in any event, I said, as I look just like Sherlock. I think my candor staggered him. My dear girl, his tone softened, that will change, or it will be changed. By my sitting for endless hours, with a book on top of my head, while playing the piano, I suppose. Days spent in torment, plus corsets, dress improvers, and false hair, although he would not say so. You come from a family of quality, with some polishing. I am sure you will not disgrace us. I said, I have always been a disgrace. I will always be a disgrace. I am not going to be sent to any finishing establishments for young ladies. Yes, you are glaring across the table at each other, in the candlelit twilight, who had given up any pretense of dining. I am sure he was aware, as I was, that both Lane and Mrs. Lane were eavesdropping in the hallway, but I, for one, did not care. I raised my voice. No, get me a governess, if you must, but I am not going to any so-called boarding school. You can't make me do so. He actually softened his tone, but said, Yes, I can. And I shall. What do you mean? Shall you shackle me to take me there? He rolled his eyes. Just like her mother, he declared to the ceiling, and then he fixed upon me a stare so martyred 
so condescending that I froze Richard. In tones of sweetest reason, he told me, Enola, legally I hold complete charge over both your mother and you. I can, if I wish, lock you in your room until you become sensible, or take whatever other measures are necessary in order to achieve that desired result. Moreover, as your older brother, I bear a moral responsibility for you, and it is plain to see that you have run wild too long. I am perhaps only just in time to save you from a wasted life. You will do, as I say. At that moment, I understood exactly how Mum had felt during those days after my father's death, and why she had made no attempt to visit my brothers in London, or welcome them to Ferndale Park, and why she had tricked money out of Mycroft. I stood up. Dinner no longer appeals to me. You'll excuse me, I'm sure. I wish I could say I swept with cold dignity out of the room, but the truth is I tripped over my skirt and stumbled to the stairs.